Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Property Pod. Today, I'm joined by Will, who is our partner here at Wells. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, And um, today, we're going to be speaking about sort of a guide to purchasing leasehold property and what you need to do. Um, so thanks for coming on. It's great to have you here. Lovely. Um, so what are the basic differences between a freehold and a leasehold property? Well, there's a really important distinction to make between freehold and leasehold. The starting point is probably to think of a freeholder as owning the land and the building. A leaseholder owns a defined area of space within the building. Typically in England and Wales, flats are leasehold and houses are freehold. It should be really clear to you when you make your offer. A state agent should be clarifying the basis upon which the property is offered. But if there's a leasehold property, there's a whole raft of other considerations that you have to take into account. And we'll consider those during the course of this conversation. Okay, great. And what is a lease? Well, a lease is probably best understood as being a contract between a freeholder who owns the land and building and the leaseholder who owns a space within the building. There are four elements probably to a lease that we need to understand. The first is that the lease, this contract, this agreement, would define the specific area that the leaseholder is entitled to occupy. So that might be two bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen, but plus the staircase and possibly some garden land outside. So your lease is one document which will define the area that you're actually buying. The second really important element is that a lease runs for a certain period of time, a certain number of years, and the clock is ticking from the date that the lease is created. So when you're purchasing a leasehold property, probably the most important question you have to ask is, how many years are left on the lease? And is the length of a lease important? The length of a lease is really important, yeah, because you need to know um, how long you're going to be able to own and occupy the property for. And if the lease term is reducing, it may also affect the value of the property as well. So when you come to sell, you don't want to be left with too few years on the lease because it will make the property harder to sell. Typically, when a new lease is granted, it will be for 99 years or 125 years. But if you're the second or third owner, then necessarily that number of years will have reduced over time. So as I say, key question at the outset, how many years are left uh, are left on the lease. The other thing to bear in mind is that if you're purchasing with the benefit of a mortgage, the mortgage lender will require a minimum term. That's typically around 75 years. So if the lease has dropped below 75 years, it may be difficult to get a mortgage to assist you with the purchase of the property. So um, that's probably the level at which we're saying to our clients, you know, you need to be thinking about extending the lease if you get to 75 years and below. And how can I extend my lease? You can extend your lease in one of two ways. Firstly, by pursuing the formal route. Formal route's available to you if you've owned the property for two years, and it involves serving a formal notice on the freeholder explaining that you wish to extend your lease. And that then triggers a subsequent process which results in a lease extension. The informal route involves contacting your freeholder and explaining that you want to extend your lease and then trying to negotiate on an informal basis in the hope that you can agree terms. We always recommend to our clients that they pursue the informal route first and if that fails to reach a satisfactory conclusion, then they always have the fallback position of activating a formal application for a lease extension. Okay, great. And what does share of freehold mean? Often you'll see a leasehold property advertised with a share of freehold. What this typically means is that the seller of the flat is not only selling you their lease, but they're selling also a share in the freehold interest of the building. So we remember that the freehold is the land and buildings of which the flat forms part. Now what this tends to indicate is that in the past, the leaseholders have got together and acquired by purchase, the freehold interest in the building. They have then divided it, usually by acquiring it in a company and giving every participant a share. That share is then passed on to the new purchaser of a flat. So if you're looking in the estate agent's window and the flat is advertised as being share of freehold, what that typically means is you'll get the lease, but you'll also get a share in the freehold interest in the building. This is generally considered advantageous because it gives you as an individual a voice in the management of the block. So there's no separation of ownership between freehold and leasehold. The owners of the flats also collectively together own the freehold of the building, which is generally considered to be a healthier arrangement because 
they have the opportunity to self-manage and decide how their block should be run and managed, which is, you know, a good thing. Mm, definitely. And can I purchase the freehold during my ownership? You can. Um, so if you own a long lease of a flat, the opportunity to purchase the freehold might arise. But the important thing to bear in mind is that you can't do it on your own. It's a collective um, application. So if you're interested in purchasing the freehold of your block, what you need to do is contact the other owners of flats within your block. You need to get around 50% or over support for that application. So, um, you know, if you've got nine uh, flats in your block, then you'd need four other people to make five in total as a minimum to qualify you for an application to purchase the freehold. And then there's a process whereby you would serve a notice on the freeholder asserting your right to purchase the freehold. That process is followed and it results in the acquisition of the freehold. And it's that situation that we described earlier, which then results in each of the participants having a share of the freehold. Um, and again, um, there are benefits around self-management, but also the opportunity, if it's required, to grant yourselves lease extensions. So rather than negotiating with a third party, you're now agreeing between yourselves as participants the terms on which your lease can be extended. Um, there is a cost involved because it's actually a purchase, but that cost often makes more sense per individual than individually extending your leases. It tends to work out as better value, plus you have the advantage of being able to advertise your flat upon sale as including a share of the freehold. And are there any restrictions to that? The lease, um, as we stated at the outset, is a contract between the freeholder and the leaseholder, and uh, a typical lease will run to about 30 pages. It's full, effectively, of terms and conditions. And this is another important distinction between a freeholder and leaseholder. You buy a freehold house, there may be some historic restrictive covenants on the title, but more or less it's yours to do with as you please. You're not answerable to anybody else. Um, if you buy a flat, you're answerable to the freeholder, and there will be a long list of restrictions and um, um, regulations that will apply to your use of the property. And it's an important distinction to make in terms of an adjustment of the mindset, really, to think, well, I am buying this flat, but what I'm actually buying is the right to live here for a certain number of years, subject to these conditions. I mean, these typical conditions that you see are you can't keep pets in the property. You can't play loud music after 11 o'clock. You can't change the layout of the property without the consent of the freeholder. And it's really important when you're buying a flat that you get to grips with those restrictions because, you know, if you're a cat lover, for example, and there's a restriction in your lease, then this maybe isn't the property for you. Um, you need to understand those terms and conditions that are going to apply to you. And also during the course of purchasing a property, it's important to understand whether or not these restrictions have been complied with in the past. You don't want to purchase a flat knowing that the lease has been breached in the past because you as the new owner will be answerable to the freeholder for the historic breaches. So it's really important that your conveyancer is looking at the past conduct of the seller to make sure that all of these terms and conditions have been applied, uh, complied with over time. Okay, great. And are there any service charges? Service charges apply in almost all leasehold situations, yes. And that's because the freeholder, under their agreements, under the lease, assumes certain obligations. Those typically include insuring the building, so that's for buildings insurance, and also repairing the property to make sure that it's all maintained, the roof is in good order. If there are any gardens, then they'd be maintained common parts, so hallways and lifts and car parks within the estate of the freeholder all have to be maintained at private expense and that expense falls to each individual leaseholder. Uh, the payments that you make to the freeholder in return for this repair and insurance is termed service charge and service charge again you know, is a really important thing to get to grips with during the purchase of a flat because it's a regular usually monthly sometimes six monthly outgoing that you need to budget for. So you need to understand what service charges are going to be payable. Um, you can look at the past to see what's typically been paid in the, uh, in the past, but you also need to look to the future to see if there are, for example, a scheme in, to replace all the windows in the block. If that were coming in the next two or three years, what we call major works, 
then you would have to pay your share of that. So it's really important that you look not just at what's been paid in the past, but whether or not there are any schemes of major works in the future that could result in unusual expenditure. Because um, the, um, the service charge liability is recurring. It's a continuous obligation that will apply throughout your ownership of the flat. And so when you're budgeting you know, for your purchase, you need to look not just at uh, your mortgage payments and your t utility bills, but also what are the service charges going to be and make sure that that's an affordable proposition. So, uh, yeah, most leases do include a service charge. And can you challenge the service charges? Service charges are challengeable. There is quite a lot of helpful legislation in place and the key tenets really are that service charges have to be reasonably incurred and they have to be reasonable in their quantum. So um, if you look at a bill and you think, well, grass-cutting, um, you know, why is the grass cutting costing £5,000 a year, then there's a chance that you're being overcharged. And in that event, um, you can challenge it by application to a specialist tribunal. Um, the benefit, going back to one of our earlier points about acquiring the freehold, is that you as a group of leaseholders um, assume responsibility for these contracts. So you can choose who cuts the grass and what you pay for the grass cutting. If you have a remote freeholder, then these charges are imposed upon you. What happens in practice is that the process of challenging service charges is quite technical and often, you know, regrettably, leaseholders do take the decision just to pay rather than to incur the cost of a challenge. And in that situation, sometimes it's worthwhile talking to your neighbours and making sure or establishing whether they feel the same way about the charges. And if they are excessive, then together you can group together and challenge the service charges. What happens in the tribunal is that the tribunal judge will hear representations from both sides. The freeholder will be saying, oh, this is very much the going rate, or you know, it's really difficult to find somebody to cut the grass in this particular location. And the leaseholders will be saying, no, no, grass cutting should be costing X. And the tribunal will then make a decision on what is a reasonable amount and will fix the service charge accordingly. So you do have some protection on service charges, um, and that's a process that you can follow. And um, what is ground rent? Ground rent is an annual rent. It's, an, it's a key quality of a lease. A lease must always have a rent. For, a for an agreement to be a lease, um, there, it's essential that there is a, this ingredient of ground rent. And that can be anything from a peppercorn, which is effectively zero, a notional ground rent, um, to much higher sums running into the hundreds of pounds per year. Um, Ground rent is, um, is usually payable annu annually and um, it's another element of the lease that as a purchaser you need to understand um, uh, how much am I going to be asked to pay. Unlike service charge which reflects services rendered, ground rent is pure profit for the freeholder, it's money in his pocket effectively. Um, the government has changed the position on ground rent as recently as June this year, 2022 when ground rents were effectively abolished in new leases. So if you go to buy a flat now, you wouldn't expect to pay any ground rent. But that doesn't affect any leases granted prior to that date where ground rent will apply. And we saw, you know, in, in more recent history, um, some quite insidious practices on the part of freeholders whereby you would have a ground rent that would start at quite a high level, but then it would double perhaps every 10 years. And if you see something like that in a lease, you need to be really cautious because that accelerating ground rent is both unattractive to potential purchasers in the future, but also mortgage lenders don't like, though, because it affects the affordability, um, mortgage lenders don't like accelerating ground rent clauses. So another key question to be asking during the purchase of a leasehold property is, how much do I have to pay in ground rent? Uh, and does it increase in the future? Okay. And what is a sinking fund? A sinking fund is a really useful device, um, which may or may not be included in your lease. And it's worth trying to establish whether or not there is a sinking fund. Usually when you get a bigger or a more modern block, there will be provision for a sinking fund. And what it is, is it's a regular charge that the freeholder makes through the service charge. And it might be, say, £20 a month per flat, something like that. And the sinking fund is this idea that there's a, a pot of cash that's being accumulated by the freeholder, still belongs to the leaseholders, but it's kept by the freeholder and it's applied towards future expenditure so if you do need to replace the roof 
we do need to replace the windows, big scheme of major works, then the freeholder can call upon this accumulated pot of cash, which we call a sinking fund, to cover the cost of that. It's effectively saving incrementally to pay big bills in the future. It's a really useful device, and if you're buying a flat, try to establish if there is a sinking fund, because if there is, and it's been accumulated over time and hasn't been spent, then you'll benefit from that sinking fund in the future, rather than having to put pay you know, a large one-off payment in the future. You'll have the benefit of the accumulated sum. Um, so that is a sinking fund. Okay, great. And are there any other charges? There, it's important to um, understand whether or not there are any other charges. Um, typically, the charges are rendered when a leaseholder asks the freeholder for something. So if you ask for permission to change the layout of your flat, the freeholder will say, yes, you know, if I'm happy with your plans, but you must pay my costs of doing that. Um, if there's a breach of the lease, so if, for example, you're keeping a pet, to use the earlier example, when you shouldn't be, and the freeholder has to investigate that breach, then you may have to pay the freeholder's costs incurred in that investigation. Also, when you come to sell your flat, you need to get a pack of information off the freeholder about the service charge regime, the insurance, the management of the block, and the freeholder will charge a fee for the supply of that pack. And also when you buy a flat, you need to notify the freeholder that you've completed your purchase and the freeholder will charge you for sending that notification. So those are some common examples of other charges. And critically, I suppose the distinction is these are charges that you wouldn't face usually in a freehold situation, but they're additional charges that apply because the property is leasehold. Um, so yeah, um, again, it's all part of the due diligence when purchasing the property to read the lease, ask questions of your conveyancer, and make sure that you understand the full extent of your future liability when purchasing a leasehold property. Okay, that's great. Well, that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been great to have you. And um, for all you guys at home, if you did enjoy this episode and found it useful, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.